so uh, Charles Wesley uh, and his brother John Wesley, uh, and you can debate like who founded Methodism. I went to a Methodist, uh, not that I'm Methodist, but I went to a Methodist uh, university in Los Angeles, uh, Methodist based. Uh, uh, as a Baptist, that was interesting. Uh, so, you know, I studied a little bit of, of uh, Methodism, but uh, Charles Wesley and his brother, John Wesley, you could debate, like, who founded Methodism. And so if you're, any Methodist here today? One, <laughs> two, yeah, just a couple. Yeah, this, this sermon's for you. Uh, and, and so uh, Charles Wesley and his brother, John Wesley, were basically like the co-founders of, of uh, uh, the Methodist movement. Uh, probably more so his brother John, but I'm not going to debate that point. Uh, if you want to get into that, I would submit to you the fountainhead of all knowledge and information is Wikipedia. <laughs> Just check into it yourself. Uh, but anyway, uh, in doing research on uh, on Charles Wesley, who wrote "Come Thou Long Expected Jesus," uh, I was absolutely shocked to find uh, that he he is known as the the greatest hymn writer of all time. Did you know that? I didn't. I didn't know that. I didn't know that that he wrote 6,500 hymns. You know, you got to sit and ask yourself. I mean, I took 10 years of piano. I can play, but I can't write songs. I can mess with the ones that are written, but I'm sitting there thinking, I got 6,500. Uh, he preached as well and taught. How do you have time to write that many? That, that is mind-boggling. So then, then you, then thinking minds want to know, well, what did he write? Then you start looking at, well, he wrote, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's Etc. He wrote all of that. Um, he wrote Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Really? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to cover that one. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to be in, uh, I start a sabbatical tomorrow. Uh, so I'm not going to be here next, I'll be here in church. I'm just not preaching. So next Sunday, I'm going to let uh, Pastor Bob uh, bring the word. So he has the task of bringing to you Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And I'll be sitting here analyzing him and just, you know, front row, <laughs> taking notes. Yeah. So pray for Bob as he prepares this week, because it's not easy to take a carol, and to, what, am I gonna, what am I gonna say about that? So uh, Charles, uh, just what a, when I was thinking about him, I'm thinking, wow, what a great song to follow the Psalter in, because who wrote a, uh, many of those Psalms of David, who, whose heart was just overflowing with love for God, and you see that he, he poured that into many of the Psalms, just like Charles. I'm thinking, man, is my heart overflowing with the Lord? So much so that I could write, you know, just him after him, uh, to him, uh, what, a, what a great blessing that he was. So when you look at uh, Come Now Long Expected Jesus, uh, you want to know, like, how, where did this, what was the inspiration for this? Uh, the inspiration came from Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. Now, what he did is he, he as a pastor uh, who had great compassion for people, uh, living in uh, 1744 um, when this happened, uh, he's looking at the poverty around him. Uh, he's looking at the injustice around him. He's looking at the class divisions within England at the time. Uh, and he had, had, had great uh, emotion about what he saw as a pastor because he wanted solutions to these things. Kind of sounds a lot like us today. And he was reading one day in, uh, in Haggai chapter 2, which says this. Uh, God, uh, this prophet speaking to Zerubbabel. Uh, he says, now take care of Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. And all you people of the land, take courage. He's now told him to be hopeful three times, declares the Lord. And work, he wants them to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. He says, for I am with you, uh, says the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made to you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Based on that, what does he tell him? Don't fear. What are you worried about? What are you worried about? Uh, don't, don't fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and also the dry land and I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations and I, I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. This is an interesting passage worthy of uh, analysis, but this was the passage that prompted him to write this, come thou long expected Jesus. Why did he do that? Because this particular uh, um, minor prophet is speaking to the Jews post-exilic period. Uh, they have not finished rebuilding the temple. Uh, it's just sitting there and, uh, and the prophet comes to them and tell them, you, you need to get to work. God should be first, you should be second. And they had reversed that. And so the prophet's castigating them in a way, but he's also encouraging to get to build the temple. And he does, he, this, by the way, happened in 520 BC. Uh, and what he does to encourage them to build God's temple is he does two things. Number one, and I'll get to come down long, expect to Jesus in a minute, in case you're wondering. 
Uh, he, he's, he says, Let's, you got to look to the past. God tells the Israelites, you got to look to the past. Remember, I promised you in Egypt that I would be with you no matter what. And you're thinking, this is 520 BC. The Egyptian, Egyptian bondage was like 1446. God had not forgot his promise. So he says, remember, I promised to be with you. So whenever you think all hope is lost, injustice, et cetera, is all around you, what's Jesus whisper in your ear? I always promise to be with you. I haven't deserted you. He says, look back to the past and then also look to the future. So God says, look to the future. You're going to rebuild this temple. It's going to pale in insignificance in light of the Solomonic temple. But there's one day there's going to be a greater temple. Just you can read about it in Ezekiel uh, chapters 40 uh, through 48. Uh, when the, the Messiah comes and rules and reigns from Jerusalem, the king of kings, when he shows back up, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, he says, uh, focus on the future because there's going to come a day. That, that I am going to descend, and I'm going to shake the planet, and I'm going to deal with evil, and I'm going to set things straight. So you just trust in the fact that I'm coming back. Remember, I'm a God who's with you, and I'm also coming back to establish my kingdom. You just hold on. Don't throw in the towel. Have hope. See, that's what he read, because he's looking at poverty. He's looking at injustice. He's looking at class division. As a pastor, he's going, well, what do I do? How do I, how do I help people? How do I help my culture? How do I help England, etc." He says, well, I think I'll write a song. And what's the song? You should know the song at this point. It's a test. Come. Do you know the song? <laughs> okay, yeah. Come, now long expect to Jesus. Uh, what does that song teach us? Well, it, uh, it tells us this. And if you were to principalize it, put it into a main idea, it would go like this, in my mind. Saints, Christians, they long to see the Messiah's redemptive kingdom realized. Don't you? Don't you? I think about it every day. I kid you not. I'm like, Lord, I, I, you know, yeah. What's taking you so long? Like, what are you waiting for? You know, and he's got to be looking down from heaven. I'm, like, I'm coming, I'm coming. You know, and it's that you long to see him because you see all the pain, all the suffering, all the evil, the advancement of wickedness, little gains of righteousness here and there. But it's just like, I have to watch evil flaunt itself. Lord, why don't you, can you show up and set things straight? You said you're going to shake the, the planet one day upon your arrival. Could, could I see that? What's taking you so long? So I identify with this song, Come Now Long Expected Jesus. So, because I long to see him, and I know many of you do, because you tell me you do. Because you stop me in between the services, when's he coming? Etc. So, two things from this passage. We're going to break it up into two points. Um, this particular song, uh, two verses, uh, divides along uh, two lines in my mind. Number one, uh, our longing as a Christian to see righteousness reign over wickedness. Because remember, Jesus taught you how to pray in the, in the, in the great prayer that we all should know, Right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Then what's the next part? Thy kingdom come. What, do you, what kingdom? The Davidic kingdom of the Messiah, prophesied to come to the planet. You're praying, God, my, that's part of the prayer. So when you think about that longing that you should have, even in your prayer life, two things are apparent from this passage of this song. Number one, our longing should be based on uh, prophetic promises. That, because they're all throughout the Old Testament. Our longing, like that of Israel, should be based on prophetic promises. Uh, literal promises that were literally fulfilled over the course of time. Now, we know that Israel, uh, we'll get to our, our age in a minute, their longing was for the Messiah to come and deal with the problem from the garden. And we know that's the, the case because in Genesis chapter 3, 15, which I've told you for the last 13 years, first prophecy of the Old Testament is God talking to the devil who plunged us all into sin by the deceptions of Adam and Eve, um, he tells the devil this in verse 15. I will put, God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and, he, and you shall bruise him on the heel. He says, you're going to have a constant battle between truth and error, light and darkness, goodness and godlessness. And this is going to be going on and you're going to inflict a wound on the seed who's coming to deal with you, but, but it's not going to kill him right? Because it's just a bruise on his heel. But he's going to deal a head blow to you. He's going to take you out, devil. So all throughout the Old Testament, what do you see? You, you see a, a battle between good and evil, light and darkness, etc. The, the true seed and the false seed, uh, all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, there was a book a long time ago, I don't even know if it's even in print anymore, called The Conflict of the Ages, which traces this. It's in a mind-boggling book. So the Jews understood that the seed was going to come and then through prophetic revelation, God's going to show you should long for this coming because it's going to come, and I'm going to give you precise data points to know who you're looking for, 
what's, what's the Messiah, the seed's mission, etc. So I'm going to just touch upon, there's 333 exact prophecies of the Messiah. So anybody who tells me you're a Christian because you have blind faith, I'm like, uh, no, you don't understand faith. Faith is based upon the evidences that are seen. And then I submit to the evidences. So when I look at the 333 exact prophecies of Christ, we're just going to, you want to cover all of them? It would be awesome. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's just look at five of them quickly. Uh, uh, progressive revelation. God says the seed is coming. Battle between good and evil. Because if you look at your world today, what is going on? Battle between good and evil until the Messiah comes and sets things straight. So we were told in Genesis 12, 3, that the Messiah would come from the seed of Abraham. Because it says in 12, 3, and in you, Abraham, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. How, blessed how? Because the seed's going to come through your line, the promised seed. Uh, Genesis 49, verse 10, says that the Messiah would come specifically, not just through the line of the Jews, the Israelites, but through the tribe of Judah, because it says the scepter, royal rulership, shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall the obedience be of the peoples. Shiloh in Hebrew, by the way, is best translated whose it is or who it belongs to. What? Rulership rights. Belongs to who? The Messiah. He's coming. He's going to come through Abraham. He's going to come through Judah, etc. cetera. Uh, it also says in Jeremiah 23, 5, that the Messiah would come from the house of David. It says, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. What do you mean by branch? Well, because the Babylonians destroyed uh, Israel in 586 BC when they cut down the, the, the tree, as it were, of Israel. But it's, you know, if you cut a tree down and you don't have the stump grinder come in, what do you get? <laughs> Trust me, I know. I mean, what do you get if you don't get rid of the stump? You get another tree or a couple of trees that come out of that. Those shoots before, form branches, form new trees. So he says the, the Babylon, uh, Babylonians might wipe out your nation, but it's not going to destroy God's plan. Uh, the seed's coming. He's become the branch. And when the branch comes, he's going to rule righteously. Why? Well, he's the king from the line of David. So when you think about Jesus, uh, was he Jew? Check. Hmm. Uh, was he from the tribe of Judah? Check. Uh, was he from the Davidic line? Check. Um, then it also says in Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, the little city of Bethlehem, just outside of Jerusalem, uh, east or west of Jerusalem. Micah 5, 2 says, but as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, he had to name that particular location because there's two Bethlehems in Israel. Too little to be among the clans of Judah for, from when one will go forth uh, uh, for me to be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth, the Messiah that's coming, are from long ago. How long ago? Well, from days of eternity. Who would the Messiah be? Well, exactly who God said he was going to be. He will be the eternal one who will be born. He will be the God-man. Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, who was born there? The God-man. See, that's, that's exactly what Isaiah said, contemporary of, of Micah, when he said, when he comes, he will be God with us. God was born, not in the, as, a, as a man that day. The God-man. Uh, and then it says in Isaiah 53 that the Messiah would also die as our sin substitute. Remember, we're looking at the 333 exact prophecies of the Messiah? Because those give you hope of what lies ahead. The Jews understood all these. So Isaiah 53 prophesies that the Messiah would die as our sin substitute to solve the problem that we got into with Adam and Eve. So it says, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell on him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He's talking about sin. How do you deal with the sin problem? We have a Savior who can solve the sin problem. And our sin was put on him as our Passover lamb. So when he dies, he pays the penalty for our sin. When you come to him in faith, his blood then covers your life and his wrath passes over you. He's your sin substitute. So you have two kinds of people in the world. Those who understand Jesus as their sin substitute and their sin is covered. And those who are not covered. You're either covered or not covered. I can tell you which one I'd rather be. Covered. That's why he came. So those are only five of the exact prophecies. So born of, the, born of the line of Abraham, from the tribe of Judah, uh, the Davidic line, uh, born in Bethlehem, um, and he would be the sin substitute because he was because he hung on the cross for our sins, etc. And so when you think about this overwhelming evidence of the prophecies, uh, René Pache, a French scholar, uh, has written a book on uh, the subject, uh, and he says this about the law of probabilities because he anticipated a thinking church like our church. 
What's the probability that one man who cannot control all those factors fulfilled them? He says this. According to the law of probabilities, there would be one chance out of 83 billion, do you hear me? That so many predictions would come true in the case of one single individual. Needless to say, Pache says, such a chance, and he has in scare quotes, does not exist. And not one, but the omniscient God could predict and act like this. No, I'm adding this to myself. No kidding. I don't know what that is in French, but no kidding. No kidding. There's no way. He can't control. Could you control who your parents were? Family line? Nothing. You couldn't control any of that because city? Not, nothing that. So Jesus couldn't control those things. Uh, because God foretold them for hundreds of years prior to his arrival. Dr. Norman Geiser, who's now with the Lord, uh, wrote this once about the probabilities. He said, mathematicians have calculated the probability of 16 predictions out of the 333 being fulfilled by one man to be one in 10 to the 45th power. 16. He says, uh, if we uh, go to 48 predictions, the probability is one in 10 to the 157th power. Translated, it is almost impossible, Geyser says, for us to conceive of a number that big. No kidding. Uh, mathematician Marvin Bettinger, who has sold over 12 million college math texts, calculated the probability of nine, nine prophecies coming true in Christ to be one and 10 to the 76th power. He says, that is like picking the same grain of sand four times in succession in a domed football stadium full of sand. <gasps> Could you imagine? You had four little pieces of sand and you made them red and threw them arbitrarily in there and go pick somebody and said, we're gonna open the door and you can sift through there. You got four picks. You never miss. You picked them up four times in a row, the right ones. You would be thinking what? No, yeah, no, no, no way, no way. That's what Jesus did. So Israel had a longing for the coming of Messiah based on the evidences of the prophecies. Prophecies should give you a great longing for God, God because he's telling you with specificity to follow closely uh, my arrival. We too, like Israel, have specificity when it comes to prophecy, do we not? We're studying Revelation on uh, Sunday nights at 6.30. We're in chapter 17 tonight, if you wanna come. Uh, we're looking at God's plan for the end, and really the beginning, when he shows up. But we have uh, many prophecies that we look forward to, like Israel did. They look forward to 333 exact prophecies. We have many in the New Testament of what's coming. Well, what's coming? Uh, well, I'll tell you what's coming, because God tells you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, what is, what does Paul say? I don't want you to be uninformed. I think the King James reads ignorant, uh, brethren, about those who are fallen asleep. And that is a euphemism in Greek for death. So don't, don't, don't worry about those who, Christians who died, uh, that you may not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Christians don't have hope. They just live from day to day. It says, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do as Christians, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For we say to you that by the word of the Lord that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet shofar of God. Uh, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those who are alive shall remain and be caught up, caught up, caught up, go up, uh, to be together with Christ in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What, what's our promise? That one day, imminently, at any moment, you can hear this shofar horn go off, and you're going to know, I'm out of here. <laughs> Wouldn't this be cool? Just leaving my whole house payment to the devil. Just, I'm gone. <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't have to go to the Pentagon anymore. I don't have to slug. I don't have to have a windowless office. I'm out of here. And who's going to be going up before you? The dead in Christ. Where are they? Well, they're presently in heaven, like my dad's in heaven. But when he hears the shofar, boom, God takes him and glorifies his physical body and makes it like Christ. He ascends first, and then we go up after them to go meet Christ in the clouds, to be with him. Who doesn't have a longing for that? I mean, I have a longing. I think about it all the time. Man, Lord, can I, trumpet time. Remember hammer time? <laughs> Remember him? Yeah. yeah, he lived not too far from where my last church was. You'd see him driving around in his uh, giant uh, uh, Humvee hum kind of car, but I don't need hammer time. I need trumpet time, because trumpet time gives you great hope, doesn't it? I mean, Lord, could I just, man, I can't wait to go up. 
go up. Now, there's additional prophetic utterances that, that uh, come to us uh, because we know he's coming for the church because uh, the time of judgment is for Israel. It's time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. He, come, he comes to deliver us. He says he does. But then he's also telling us that he's going to come back at the end of the tribulation. Tells, tells you he is. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. And at the end of that, he comes back. Matthew 16, what did Jesus say? Uh, the Son of Man is a code word for Jesus. The Son of Man is going to come in the glory of the Father with his angels, and he will then recompense every man according to his deeds. I don't want to be on the receiving end of that one. Who wants to stand before him and go, my works are good. You're going to allow me into heaven, no problemo. Or problema, problema? Yeah. He's going to go, no, no, your works are no good. My work on the cross means everything. Did you know me? What, Matthew 24, Jesus says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all of the earth, all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn. Why? They made a huge mistake. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with great power and glory. They're going to see it because he's going to turn off all the luminaries. It's going to be pitch black when the, his dimensionality breaks into our dimensionality and they see his brilliant glory. That's when the non-Christian goes, uh-oh, uh, he's here. It's too late to turn to him. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. For, uh, Paul says, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. This is lex talionis, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. God remembers. He says, to give uh, relief to you who are afflicted and uh, to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed, future tense, uh, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. If God shows up in flaming fire, not a good sign. It says he's dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these, he will pay, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. He has told you. He has warned you. I gave you plenty of evidence as to reason yourself to embrace me as the Messiah, statistically speaking, it's all there. And if you embrace me, I'm coming for my church. And then I'm bringing judgment to the earth for seven years, and at the end of that, I will come back and, and, and bring judgment. I mean, mano y mano, each one on their own before me. Uh, 2 Peter 3, Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, which the heavens will pass away with the roar, the elements are destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. He's telling you, this is all going to happen. So prophecies like that give us as believers uh, all the reasons why we sing, and we're still on the opening first line of the song. What is new? I actually started laughing at my desk when I'm like, I have only covered the first half of the first verse. Shocking, isn't it? What's the first part of the song say? Come. Do you know what it says? Come thou long expected Jesus. I have been expecting him since I was a little kid because I read the Bible and I put two and two together. The Lord's coming back. He came back literally as he told Israel he would and he's coming back literally. And I long for that. Do you long for that? That's what Christmas is about. Lord, come. Uh, now let's get into the rest of the song so we have little time to cover the majority of the song. Uh, our second longing should be based not on uh, prophetic uh, statements but on prophetic purposes. Point number two. So, like, what kind of prophetic purposes? Well, there's going to be three of them based on the song. So, number one, uh, the Messiah was born, according to the song, to release us from sin. That's why he was born. Let's read the words of the first uh, stanza. He come along and expect the Jesus. And then what follows? Well, he was born to do what? Set the people free. Free from what? Sin. Sin. Uh, from our fears and sins, release us. Let us find our rest in thee. Uh, Israel's strength and consolation. Hope of all the earth that thou art. Desire of every nation. Joy of every longing heart. This is amazing. So Wesley uh, absolutely knew what he was talking about because he knows that when Christ fulfills his mission uh, in his coming, which he did fulfill on the cross and then rising from the grave to defeat sin and death, he, he fulfilled that mission to be able to set us free from our sins. Because we're shackled to sin. Because when Adam and Eve fell, we all fell with them. It's called imputed sin and inherited sin. You cannot escape it. And if you do not believe in imputed sin or inherited sin, I've told you for 13 years, have a child. <laughs> you never have a lesson on lying, being stingy, 
do you? No, because they just, they just come out that way. Inherited and imputed sin. Wesley writes, let us find our rest in the... Because why does he write that? Because when you become a Christian, your soul comes to rest. You know the day you got saved. I know when I got saved in 1967. I was nine years old. I knew exactly that there was rest for my little wicked soul because I was, I was a tough little kid. And, and that little strong-willed child met Jesus. And he helped break my will. Uh, and, and, and I found rest. I knew I found rest that day. When the pastor put his big old arms around me, he was a Navy captain, a chaplain, put his big old arms around me and said, welcome to the family of God. I was sobbing. Do I look like a crier? <laughs> I was sobbing up at the front of the church, and then they led me out sobbing because he, he said to me, today the angels sing for you. Rest. You rest. I mean, if you're not a Christian, I, I, I know you don't have rest because I used to be where you are. He, he, he writes, he born to set us free. When you are free from your sin at the feet of the cross, there's nothing like it. See, the shepherds figured this out about Jesus being the Savior. Luke 2, verse 10. And the angel said to them when he appeared to them on that starry night, do not be afraid. No kidding. If an angel showed up to you out camping in the darkness, you, your knees would be knocking. Do not be afraid. I am bringing you good news and great joy, which shall be for all people. What's the news? For today in the city of David, what city is that? Yeah, Bethlehem uh, of David. There has been born for you a Savior. Who's the Savior? Who's Christ? The, the Messiah, the anointed one. He's the Lord. He's the Lord. The God-man has been born. Uh, th this, is, uh, this is what gives you hope, is that there has been a Savior born. See, he's the solution to the problems of the world. They don't have a Savior. And once they come to know the Savior, there's peace. Number two. So, so what, I back up just to say, when you see that Jesus is the Savior, what's the logical response of you who know that? He released you from your sins. That when you do see him face to face, you long to tell him, I think, one thing. I long to tell him one thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Remember the old song? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for doing what? Making me whole. Thank you. Number two. Uh, the Messiah also was born, according to the song, uh, to rule us, to rule us in a positive way. Here's the lyrics. Uh, born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us and in, in you forever. Now gracious kingdom, now, now thy gracious kingdom bring to kingdom. Be by thine own eternal spirit, rule in our hearts alone. So there's a tension here. There's a tension that when you come to know Christ as your savior, he rules in you. And he's going to rule over you when he brings to the kingdom, as he prophesied. Romans 10, verse 9, Paul says, and it's conditional, because you have a free will. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, who? Lord. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you believe that those things to be historically true in time and space, that's the cause. What's the effect? You're saved. You're saved. Say from what? The wrath of God. And he just made you his child. See, uh, I, I got to terms with that, you know, in September of 1967. I, I settled that one. I confess Jesus as Lord, who's risen from the dead. I was saved. I have to ask you, you saved? You saved? Based on the evidence? Are you saved? Because um, he tells you when you get saved, Jesus becomes your Lord. He becomes your Lord. He is my Lord. I'm responsible to him. My thought life, how I speak, how I treat other people, how I respond to situations, how I work, my work ethic, everything about me, I know I'm responsible to live for him because he's my what? Lord. He's my Lord. So he, he, he writes her, uh, reign in us forever. And indeed he does. It's, it's kind of a, uh, you believe in eternal security? Why? Because he reigns in you forever. He doesn't reign in you based upon your performance or he wouldn't reign. <laughs> oh, they're saying again, I'm out of here. No, they confessed, I'm back again. No, they sin again, I'm out of here. No, reign in us forever. Uh, if you know that he reigns in you forever, again, what do you long to tell him when you see him? Thank you, Lord, for being my Lord. Uh, the other thing he tells you, that uh, he's going to be the Lord when he sets up his kingdom, the future kingdom. Daniel 7 says this. Daniel prophesies about the end. Daniel said, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man, uh, that Jesus uses to call himself in the New Testament, was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days, this is the Father, the Holy Father, 
uh, it was on his throne, and he was presented to him. And to him was given, uh, the Messiah, dominion, glory, and a, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, the nations, and the men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and, and it will not pass away, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. And he, which is the Antichrist, will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one prior to the arrival of Christ. And he will intend to make alterations in times and law. He will go about changing everything everybody held sacred. And they will be given to his hand for a time, times, and a half a time, three and a half years. But the court will, be, will sit in judgment, and his dominion, Jesus' dominion, or the Messiah's dominion, will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. Amen to that one. And then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. Who wins at the end of the day? The church. Saints. Because the devil's kingdom is destroyed. And the Messiah appears and says, here's my kingdom, and you're going to be working for me in my kingdom. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. This has not happened yet. Why? Because Jesus told us to pray, thy kingdom, what? Come. Which, what is he talking about? That kingdom. See, Wesley understood from his understanding of prophetic literature that when the Messiah comes back and rules and reigns, as, as it says he will in Isaiah 2, that he will rule and reign in his empire in Jerusalem, he understands that when he comes back, many great things come with him, like peace, joy, holiness, justice, all the stuff missing today, is back when Jesus arrives, and it's an eternal thing. Don't you long for that? Third thing, last thing. Jesus also uh, came to relocate us. Uh, see, this is, this, is, this is the prophetic plan of, of God. He wants to relocate us. Uh, it says here, by thine all-sufficient merit, raise us to thy glorious throne. By his work, raise us as Christians to his throne, which is just a code word for heaven. So when a, when a believer dies, uh, where do they go? Where do they go? What did Jesus say? Well, in Luke 23, Jesus turns to the repentant thief on the cross and says to him, the guy, the guy tells, tells Jesus, remember me, a criminal, a sinner, when you come in your kingdom. The convict had great theology. He knew the king and the kingdom were coming, and he knew the messianic king was hanging on the cross next to him. And so he says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said, oh, truly I say unto today, Today, you, whatever your name is, Yehuda, whatever his name was, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Imagine, imagine, that guy traded death for life, wickedness for holiness, hell for heaven, with one prayer on the cross. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise, paradidos in Greek means trees and forests. So when you, if you wake up and you don't see trees and forests, you're in the wrong place. Because Jesus said, <laughs> Jesus said, that's why you love Virginia, right? It's a taste of heaven. He said, Jesus came to relocate you, that, that at the moment of death, you wake up in God's presence. Have you ever been with somebody when they die? I have many, many times. Friends and family, been there. And it's a holy thing. You know, I was there when Elizabeth's sister, twin sister passed away when she was 33. I was there with my dad. I've been in many of those situations. Uh, and when, when they pass away, it's hard from our perspective because, you know, the mortal life is over. But then there's that great joy to know, wonder what they're looking at. Wonder what they see. Wonder what they hear. Wonder what they smell. Wonder what kind of music they're listening to. I wonder what kind of flooring they're walking on. Et cetera and et cetera go the questions. Today you will be with me in paradise. If you've lost a loved one and it's hard at Christmas to process that you lost them, uh, you should have great hope if they walked with God because where are they today? They're with Christ, <laughs> walking in paradise. See, um, 30 years later, here's what Paul said. I love this passage, and I close with this. It says, we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, by the way, uh, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, speaking of your earthly body, body it's like a tent, uh, longing to be, longing, Come thou long, expected Jesus. You're longing uh, to be clothed with your dwelling from heaven. And as much as we have having put it on, we will not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, this earthly body, we groan. No kidding, right? Uh, being burdened because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave to us the Spirit as a pledge. 
So God promised you one day he will take your old body and exchange it for something way beyond what you've got. Aren't you thankful? <laughs> Therefore, be always of good courage in knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. But we are of good courage, I say, rather uh, to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So what did Paul just say? Well, if you're not in your body, where are you as a Christian? You're with the Lord. You're with the Lord. Imagine that. But he says, think about yourself. Your body is like an old tent. And he's a tent maker. Your body's like an old tent that eventually gets wore out. Now, I know if you're like under 30 right now, you're going, that will never happen. <laughs> okay? Come around for your 40th birthday, you start realizing, well, the chest isn't really exactly where it used to be. Uh, waistline kind of expands even if I don't eat food. Eyesight's going, hearing's going, hair's going. I mean, everything's going, right? <laughs> yeah, it's going. And you're going, I, but you should be looking at this going, but I'm going to lay down this earthly tent one day, the pain, the suffering, I'm going to lay it down, and instantly I'm given a body that's like a temple. Don't you long for that day? Yeah, I do. Lord, I can't wait to see you. Come now long, expected Jesus. Uh, when I got home from church last week, I got, uh, was notified by my mom uh, that one of her friends and one of my former parishioners in California uh, is dying. Uh, and I haven't talked to this lady in, in question in 13 years because uh, I'm not that pastor out there anymore. But she's dying, and she, she wanted me to call her. So when I got home from church last week, I, I gave her a call. That was an interesting phone call because I was calling her to encourage her because she's facing death itself. She had a stroke, massive stroke. She fell down, broke both wrists. She lost one of her eyes. Um, she who used to sing at Billy Graham Crusades can't sing at all, can't see the music anyway. I mean, she's physically a tent falling apart. And I called her to encourage her. Guess what? When I hung up the telephone, guess who was encouraged? <laughs> me. Me. Because she told me this. She said, you know, she said, I had an appointment with my doctor to kind of explain what's happening to me, and it's not all good. But she said, uh, after a while, he looked at me, and he, he said to me, like, ma'am, why are you so excited? And she said, well, young man, you don't know where I'm going. <laughs> she said, he said, well, where, where are you going? You're dying. She said, oh, no. She goes, I'm going to go see Jesus face to face. She said, I've lived my whole life for this. It's going to happen. What could be more exciting? See why I got encouraged? I got chills even talking about it. I bet you I could pick a, pick a song I think she'd love to sing if she still had her voice. Come thou, long expected Jesus because that should be the longing of every saint at Christmas. Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for a Christmas carol that uh, s says much. And uh, thank you for the depth of scripture that is behind a lot of these old carols. Uh, and may the hope that is here be all about us as saints this, this, week, this week and then weeks leading to Christmas so that we can give hope to those who are hopeless. And if, if anybody's here or online watching uh, who doesn't know the Christ, um, might this be the day they say, Lord, I confess you as Lord this day, and you will save them for all time. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.